Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. We are really excited to be here to talk to you about predictive analytics on big data. Should you build or should you buy? My name is Abhi Rele, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Alan. Nice to meet you, everyone. We're both here in sunny San Jose. If you've attended any Apigee webinar in the past, you'll know that we post the entire recording of the webinar to our YouTube channel, so you can find it later on YouTube. We also post all the slides on SlideShare, so you can go look at the slides later on on SlideShare. And a shameless plug for our awesome conference that's coming up in September. We had an awesome conference last year. It's going to be even bigger and even more awesome this year. It happens September 8th through the 10th. If you haven't yet registered, we have a special code for you, Big Data 10, that gets you 10% off. So look for, looking forward to seeing many of you at the conference in September. So with that out of the way, why don't we get started? We're gonna spend maybe the next 40 minutes or so talking about three big themes. The first is give you some context around why is predictive analytics on big data so important? Why are businesses conflict, conflicted when they think about how to adopt predictive an analytics on big data? And finally, we'll give you some pointers on how you can forge a path forward so you can start benefiting from this technology. We'll take questions at the end. So start uh, sending us the questions through the Q&A tool in this webinar, and we'll take them as we you know, go to the end. All right, so Abby, tell me a little bit like, what's, what's, big, what's big about big data, predictive analytics on big data specifically? Sure, that's a great question. In a nutshell, if you think about the digital economy today, now businesses need to operate differently if they want to stay relevant and be competitive in this digital world. Mm -hmm. And there are three key trends that are influencing this. You know, the first is the move from single channel to omni-channel. Mm -hmm. You know, businesses today need to be where their customers are. You know, mm -hmm. we see that. You, we want to be served on web, mobile, kiosk, in-store, wherever we are. You know, companies also need to have a very holistic view of how their customers are interacting with them. Yeah. It's no longer sufficient to have a siloed channel specific view because that creates blind spots. And guess yeah. who sees those blind spots? Your customers. And finally, the journey that your customers have as they interact across devices and channels needs to be contextualized. Mm -hmm. It has to build upon every prior interaction because it's the same person who's interacting with you. So that's sort of the first trend. The second is this move from personalized to individualize. Okay. It's no longer sufficient to personalize, and I put that in quotes, based on a large segment that you fall into. We, you, me, and everybody on this call, we're all part of this. Yeah. We expect interactions that are digital, that are easy, yes. that yeah. are convenient, that are available on the device that's nearest to us, yeah. wherever we are, whether it's at home or on the go. Yeah. So we want, we want recommendations, we want information that's very relevant, that's very tailored to us. And we've been spoiled because we're dealing with internet giants and you know, when we interact with Amazon and Facebook and Google, we're, we want that kind of interaction. So you know, businesses really need to think about how to individualize and tailor each interaction to each person. And that's the second big trend that, yeah. that businesses are, are facing. And the third is the shift from reactive to proactive. Okay. You know, in this digital world, it's so competitive. People make decisions in the moment. You know, we've all done this. When you want to see a movie, you wait until it's the time to see the movie to then go look up what are the ratings, what are the reviews, what are our friends saying on Facebook or yeah. Twitter. So, you know, if you, if you want to get ahead of your customers, you have to almost anticipate what they want and give it to them before they even know it so that when they need the information to make the decision, you've proactively delivered it to them and you're not reacting to issues later on. And I think that's, that's, that's true. The truth of the matter is that we've been totally spoiled by the Facebooks right. and the Googles of the world. You know, when I look at, when I use apps that I don't like, mm -hmm. I, I think to myself like, hey, if Google and Amazon and, and, and Facebook can do it, why can't you do it? Like, what, what's, what's wrong with this? I, I know this provides value, but the experience is kind of horrible. Absolutely, and we're starting to expect that from every interaction. Yeah. It doesn't matter which business we're dealing with, what task we're trying to do, where we are, yeah. we expect that level. It's almost the bar has been raised quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. So Alan, when you talk to companies, you know, as the product manager for you know, Apigee Insights, our predictive yeah. analytics offering, how are customers dealing with this? To be honest, 
not doing very well. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things that's happening in a lot of these divisions we're talking to. Number one is this concept of data lake. So mm -hmm. they're building, they're, a lot of companies are going through this big retooling of their data warehouse, going from data warehouses to Hadoop. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to put all the interaction data in one place. So just even getting all the data and putting down the infrastructure in a place where they can get all this data and collect it is very, very difficult. So they're trying to really leverage it through big data if you avoid, if you go beyond the hype. They're really Correct. trying to use all their data with these data lakes. Yeah, they're not even there yet. A lot mm. of them, a lot of them are just trying to lay down the infrastructure, right? Which leads to the second problem, which is predictive analytics. Now, a lot of them know that predictive analytics mm -hmm. is the future. They see what Google's doing. They see what Facebook is doing. They know that it's the future. But there's a lot of flux because there's a lot of flux in the, previously a lot of these companies mm -hmm. were burned by doing predictive analytics because it didn't generate the results before. And they're also looking at what's going on and they're seeing lots and lots of vendors offering different products as well. The next thing that's happening is open source. So there's a lot of rapid innovation in mm -hmm. open source and big data in general. Mm -hmm. And so they're thinking at, when they're th thinking about predictive analytics, they don't know exactly what's gonna happen because you know, just like how Hadoop was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, several years back, mm -hmm. it was kind of difficult to predict what would happen to Hadoop, kind of big data in general, whether Hadoop is going to be a standard. We're seeing that kind of innovation and flux happening in the open source world. And traditionally, predictive anal the analytics groups have been siloed. They've been on the side doing some small set of use cases. Correct. And now we're talking about bringing it in on a much larger scale. Correct, yes. Which brings us to the other issue, which mm -hmm. is actually, do they have the expertise? And so a lot of them right now are, are hiring data scientists mm -hmm. like crazy. They believe that that's the way they can move forward. It's hard to find them because they end up, even when they do find mm -hmm. them and they bring them in-house, the data scientists don't end up working on data science. They end up working on data cleanup, kind of like DBA kind of tasks. And these are not data analysts we're talking about, no. just rebranded as data scientists. These are real data scientists with computer science and data science jobs. Yeah, uh, what we've actually seen is there's two types of data scientists. Mm -hmm. You have data scientists who truly come from a machine learning mm -hmm. background with computer science degree. And then you have all the scientists who moved into IT because mm -hmm. data science is just a good place to get money. Mm -hmm. Namely, physicists, a lot of them are coming mm -hmm. into data science, math majors, mm -hmm. etc. So at the end of the day, you have data scientists who can code and data scientists who can kind of code, mm -hmm. but they're more strong on math. Mm -hmm. And the last thing they have a conflict about is what do they do with the point solutions? So what happened, we've seen is that as we went from web to mobile, they've kind of picked up a lot mm -hmm. of point solutions around predictive analytics. You're talking about recommendation engines mm -hmm. and email targeting systems. And now they're trying to figure out, what do I do with all these point solutions that I have out there? So it almost seems like you know the world you live in has changed. Yes. And it is continuing to change. The customers you're dealing with, well, you don't quite understand them because their expectations are changing. Yes. Their expectations of how they want you to serve them is changing. Correct. At the same time, the technology that you need is also changing. And to make matters even worse, there is a lot of innovation happening. Yeah. So it's not only new technologies like data lakes, but there's a lot of innovation around it. So that's creating, that's putting businesses in a very tough spot. Correct. But, you know, if you were to distill it down, what is really causing the conflict for them? Where is the real challenge coming in? Yeah, I mean, ultimately the question is, do I build it myself mm -hmm. or do it yourself with open source? Or do I go buy a product? that does it for me. This is kind of one of the big conflicts that I've talked to a lot of customers mm -hmm. that they're kind of going through this conflict right now. And it comes down to the question of whether they think at some point in time, open source will mature to the point where they don't have to go buy a product. Mm -hmm. So build versus buy. Correct. You know, this is a perennial problem. You know, customer, our business, businesses have faced this forever. Yeah. I'm sure they can analyze it, do pros and cons. Like how does that net out for answering this question? The, the way I would actually, for specifically for predictive analytics, mm -hmm. uh, the way I would net it out is I would look at the pros and cons of doing it yourself versus mm -hmm. buying. So in terms of doing it yourself, there's kind of pros there, that, or perceived pros at least. You've got more control, right? And it, by having lots of control, you can start building a competitive edge that nobody else has, mm -hmm. right? And this is due to a lot of the experience when they were using point solutions, right. you know, those point solutions, everybody else would use the mm -hmm. same point solutions and they'd get no competitive edge, right? A lot of people want to build their own competitive edge. 
cost savings. Obviously, you don't have to buy the stuff product. You know, you, you don't, and then that, that saves money, right? That can be illusionary. Uh, yeah, because the con, from a cons perspective, mm -hmm. if you're going to do it all yourself, you really need to have expertise, not just in the data science area, mm -hmm. but also in the building, mm -hmm. aka coding, as well as the uh, operations of these kinds of systems. And everyone's going after that expertise right now. Exactly, yeah. And you look at the salaries that mm -hmm. these startup companies and mm -hmm. Googles and mm -hmm. Amazons of the world are, are throwing dollars at, they're, they're, everybody's kind of competing for those same resources. And then risk, right? You got the risk around innovation, you got the risk mm -hmm. around hiring the right people. It just generates lots of risk. So there's a lot of cons on that aspect. You're just putting all this together, considering the newness, if you will, of of all these technologies, all these moving parts that you're dealing with. Correct, yes. Now from the buy side, there's really two big advantages, mm -hmm. right? One is, the, the biggest is t time to market, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that you're not assembling all this stuff yourself is gonna help you get mm -hmm. to the market faster. And then the next thing is market evolution. So when you think about a partner, when you buy, when you buy a commercial product, you have a, an expectation mm -hmm. that the product will evolve with the market whether it's new technologies or new use cases, you kind of you, you can actually rely on a vendor mm -hmm. to help that. Now the big con is hype. With all new technologies, there's always a hype cycle. Mm -hmm. And right now the hype cycle for predictive analytics is really high. It's very difficult to actually figure out whether you should do it or not, or use the product or not. And I would argue in this case, the hype is much more than it has ever been because big data is used so loosely in so many scenarios that it's very hard to evaluate if the product you're buying yeah. will actually give you the benefits. Correct, right? yes. And at the same time, there are illusions <laughs> on the do-it-yourself side as well with the cost savings and being able to put it all together. Yeah. So it doesn't seem like there is a clean answer here because in one case, you know, there are some clear benefits, but there are also equally clear risks and, and uh, you know, challenges to deal with. Yeah. On the other side, there are benefits, but then you might just be getting vaporware, right? <laughs> That's correct. So how should a company start to to, to uh, cut through the clutter, if you will, to try and figure out what their path might be forward? Well, really, you just gotta step back and you gotta deconstruct the stack. Mm -hmm. And so let me just kind of go quickly through what a predictive analytics sure. on big data would look like, and then kind of go through each layer of the stack and discuss what you need to think about on for the and there might be more boxes you know we've simplified it here just to get the key points across right. so at the very bottom is your data lake so this is where the layer where you have your Hadoop system is storing mm -hmm. doing all the raw storage and compute of your system the next layer what we call is descriptive analytics which is a fancy word for anything that's historical in the past you know what happened in the past how many orders that I have in the past last last quarter things of that sort Predictive analytics is predicting things in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Obviously, to predict in the future, you need to know what's happened in the past, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then the other area of the stack is integration. So when you talk about predictive analytics mm -hmm. and integration, it's slightly different because there's now a desire to not only connect to some BI tool like Tableau or Excel, mm -hmm. but rather you want to connect your analytics out to the actual apps your customers mm -hmm. use, right? So you really need to think really hard of whether or not you have the right integration in points with mobile, web, kiosk, partners, mm -hmm. IoT, because as we said, as you, as you mentioned before, the new normal is all about omnichannel. Mm -hmm. And last but not least is the monitoring and management. Mm -hmm. you, the stuff has to work, mm -hmm. and it has to work across all levels of the stack, right? right. So understanding, be, making it be able to monitor and manage those layers of the stack is extremely important. And not just on the day when you launch the project. It should work even a few months out. Correct. And we're talking about production apps. We're not talking about doing experiments. Right? Correct, so, yeah. So when I look at this diagram, you know, the data lake is, equates to you know, big data, all the data that, you're, that you have about your customers. The analytics then is the brains around what your customers have done or more likely to do. And integration is where the rubber meets the road yeah. and does so across different channels. Okay, so with that framework, then why don't we step through each layer sure. and talk about the dynamics that exist and help uh, you know, customers make decisions around each one. Obviously, Hadoop is the winner. The big elephant in the, the room. The big elephant in the no room. No pun intended. <laughs> All the commercial vendors out mm -hmm. there are now touting that their solutions work on top of Hadoop. So mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely clear that uh, Hadoop is the winner. Now, the thing is that, the, the another thing that you need to think about is how you store your entities and events. So it, Entities 
um, entities are things like your person, uh, you know, your profile with mm -hmm. customers, like demographics, demographics, etc. Um, events is what actually happens to the customer, mm -hmm. and what ends up happening is that if you don't have a very good data structure for storing mm -hmm. these two, then it's very difficult to merge and make sense of the intersections between different events mm -hmm. and different types of entities. And you really need this because if you think about big data, it's the rise of digital interactions that is fueling the rise of data. Correct. So being able to understand what these interactions are across different touch points, make sense of them, and derive insights from them is actually pretty key. And that's the thing that a lot of open source doesn't really kind of help. Mm -hmm. they, they give you, um, Hadoop is great because it can store anything, right? Mm -hmm. it's a, it, it allows you to store anything, but it doesn't actually tell you how to model your data or your events. Um, so, it's, so, it's, so, you know, it, it seems like from, um, from building your data lake, Hadoop as an open source technology is the winner. Whether you do it yourself or you buy it from a commercial vendor like Cloudera or Hortonworks or Pivotal. But then you really need to think about how are you going to mine all the interactions. Correct. What, just putting it in one place is a good starting point, but you also need to think about how you get insights from it. Yes, and, and you know, and, and actually what you'll find is that a lot of commercial solutions mm -hmm. out there they kind of do some of the heavy mm -hmm. lifting for you with regards to the entities and events um, modeling, which uh, is a requirement for the next phase, which yeah. is actually putting analytics mm -hmm. on top of it. So what about open source though here? When we look at entities and events, if somebody is building not just a data lake, but building an ability to handle entities and events, are there good open source tools to, to deal with entity um, and event data? Not, I mean, there are some open standards, mm -hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, they leave most of the, the, the heavy lifting up to you. So you, so it's not, and by the way, if you're going to do this, you want not just good data scientists, mm -hmm. but good computer scientists. Right, because you're probably so, going to need better data structures. You know, the old relational world may not work here, just the number correct. of tables and the complexity of the queries you would need. Correct, yeah, and, and uh, you know, Apogee has a pretty good analytics product. Mm -hmm. What we've done is that we've, we found that the graph mm -hmm. structure mm -hmm. is a very good way to model events of a user, uh -huh. joining multiple types of user events mm -hmm. together, and then joining that up with the properties of the user. So yeah, we ourselves kind of are trying to help our customers in this way. Okay, so that's data lake. I think there is some clarity here, but an area where you know our businesses need to think a little harder. Let's go to descriptive analytics. So the way I think about descriptive analytics is two types, simple and mm -hmm. complex. Simple analytics, are things that related to counting, a lot of stuff that you see in typical dashboards. Like KPIs. KPIs, key performance indicators, how many orders I have in the last month, how many orders I have in the last minute, what percentage of my customers churned out in the last mm -hmm. hour. You know, those are fairly simple analytics. And what we've actually seen in the open source world is that there's been a huge amount of innovation mm -hmm. on top of the base Hadoop to provide this. HBase, Hive, mm -hmm. Spark, Shark, there's a, well, there's a lot of companies, open source companies uh, right now, that are building kind of the uh, open source for infrastructure for this kind of simple analytics. So if you want the simple hindsight, then that is, then you have a number of open source options that you could actually leverage. Yes. Give us an example of complex. So complex is a little bit more compli it is complex. complex. Uh, an example would be clustering. Uh -huh. So automatically leveraging machine learning to create segments of different users uh -huh. uh, and learning about that. Uh, in, uh, so that's one example. Mm -hmm. Another example of complex analysis is doing path analysis, graph mm -hmm. path analysis. Mm -hmm. So this is saying like, you know, what percentage of customers, what actions did majority of the customers take after doing some certain other action? This um, could be across channels though. Co across like channels, people yes. Who bought who, of the people who bought a particular product on the web, how many went and put, called the call center, for example. Exactly, yeah, that's another example of that. And, and how is open source over there? Uh, for complex analytics, there are some, there's a lot of rapid innovation in it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it's, uh, there, are, there are solutions there, uh, but not nearly as, um, as, uh, as advanced as the simple analytics. I mean, just to give you an example, mm -hmm. Both the simple analytics and kind of data lake layer, you know, there's literally hundreds of millions of dollars that are being uh -huh. spent 
uh, probably billions of dollars that are being spent on it. Cloudera just raised like 900 million, mm -hmm. and their kind of call for, even though they're doing some complex analytics, their call claim to fame is really that data lake infrastructure and simple analytics, right. which is Impala. So it seems like for simple analytics, there are open source options, but for complex, some of the commercial vendors might have innovated faster or might be providing better solutions for specific use cases. For specific use cases, okay. correct. All right. Okay, so that's descriptive analytics. Not as clear as the data lake layer, mm -hmm. but there are, there are some open source options here. Let's go to predictive. Yeah, so this is, let's, let's spend time here because this is the most important part for our webinar. There's the difference between doing predictive analytics on summarized data versus the actual fine-grained data. One of the values of doing predictive analytics on fine-grained data is that you end up being able to get the same level of precision and recall, you get the same predictive power using very simple algorithms rather than using complex algorithms on summarized data. And, and, and this, this is really important because one of the biggest things that got people burned in predictive mm -hmm. analytics mm -hmm. in the past was the algorithms were just too difficult. They were too complicated. Mm -hmm. So even when a prediction came out, especially if the prediction was mm -hmm. wrong, they couldn't actually figure out why. So this opportunity to have the same kind of predictions mm -hmm. using simpler algorithms is truly the innovation that we're going to see in predictive analytics. So are most of the open source tools here focusing on summarizing data and then applying analytics on it? Um, so there's, I would say there's two classes. Um, you have some open source tools, mm -hmm. mainly R, uh, that is uh, great on more summarized data, smaller mm -hmm. sets of data. And we've seen a lot of innovation, like an extreme amount of innovation on big data. I'd say the three biggest ones is Mahout, Oryx, and R mm -hmm. Hadoop. Oryx was created by Cloud, is being sponsored by Cloudera mm -hmm. because in answer to Mahout, which you know they believe was not very good for big data, even though the Mahout offers I see. Uh, uh, even though the Mahout authors thought it, they mm -hmm. purposely built it for uh, kind of big data. So you're seeing a lot of innovation mm -hmm. here. Um, there really is no open source winner at this mm -hmm. point. So when you're, when you're thinking about if you're going to leverage open source, you really got to be able to put the manpower behind it because you bet on the wrong mm -hmm. horse for open mm -hmm. source. It can be very costly. I see. So you need to actually spend the time yourself to actually cut code and contribute to whatever you want to actually use. So it seems like, you know, again, if you are thinking of doing predictive analytics on big data, even though a lot of vendors claim to do predictive analytics on big data, and many open source tools are also built for that, it's important to understand whether it's working on summarized data or fine-grained data. Because summarized data might be good for general purpose use cases, but if you're really trying to understand what's happening across your customer, in your customer interactions across all the channels and touch points, you really want to be going to the fine-grained data and operating directly there so you don't lose any signals. Correct. Yeah. And that, that seems very critical here, which gets lost in the big predictive analytics or big data <laughs> the hype, yeah. hype, right? Yeah. And then you, we also talk about you know, difficult to use. You know, does that mean you need even more experienced data scientists to use some of the open source tools if you're trying to build them yourself? Um, I wouldn't actually say uh, more experienced data scientists, but it's more around the integration side. Uh, okay. I mean, predictive analytics, whether it's commercial mm -hmm. or open source, is, is predictive analytics. It's, mm -hmm. it's not going to be, you have to have smart people. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of the, the thing that you need to kind of like factor in is how easy is it to do the non-data mm -hmm. science part? There's a data preparation, some cleanup, mm -hmm. those kind of things, ancillary stuff outside of, the, right. outside of predictive right. analytics. So one thing we didn't talk about, we haven't talked about yet, is unstructured data. You know, text, for example, which if you look at expert yeah. is 80 to 90 percent of the data that an enterprise has and yet pr traditionally predictive analytics hasn't looked at unstructured data so what kinds of options exist to analyze unstructured data in the context of doing predictive analytics um, yeah so the, there, there are open source packages that do semantic analysis mm -hmm. um, and there are also commercial ones as well so uh, and, and I got just kind of uh, there I think the the key part is you need to make sure that you have the expertise to join the two types of analytical systems together. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's you're buying commercial package or you're buying, uh, well commercial, they may, they may have kind of joined some of the mm -hmm. stuff up for you. Um, so, and, and just give me an example of where we found massive usage was like at, at, at one of the health insurance companies, mm -hmm. uh, we have a predictive analytics. Just looking at the call center data, mm -hmm. it just drastically improved the power of a prediction. Right. 
but we had to extract sentiment from mm -hmm. call centers, mm -hmm. you know, people are angry in call mm -hmm. centers, mm -hmm. you gotta extract that sentiment out uh, to really understand. Um, so that's, that's actually a pretty interesting use case because a lot of the unstructured data, again, hype, some of the hype there is around analyzing social data, tweets and reviews, but there could be more interesting use cases just in your own backyard, if you will, like the call center agent notes. Yeah. Um, and that's impo it's important to take that into account and make sure that whether you build or buy, you're able to analyze unstructured data and incorporate it to improve your prediction accuracy. Because we all know that the NSA loves reading our email. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's, so, uh, you know, data lakes was fairly clear. Yeah. Descriptive analytics, a little less clear. This seems even more murky. There is just many more variables to consider, many more moving parts. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to integration, see if the trend continues. When you're talking about integrating against mm -hmm. consumer apps, it's all about APIs, mm -hmm. but you gotta differentiate an API. I mean, everybody says they have an API nowadays, but API versus a useful API. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it in terms, especially commercial kind of consumer apps, mm -hmm. you gotta think about real time, right? Like, you're not gonna wait for, when you open your mobile phone, mm -hmm. you're not gonna wait for a recommendation to happen. Or you want that recommendation to be based on the previous two interactions you just had, right? It can be based on what you did uh, two days ago. Exactly, exactly. The next thing is scalability, right? We're not talking about a, a several hundred mm -hmm. or, or a dozen BI users in your mm -hmm. organization. We're talking about a millions of customers mm -hmm. using mobile apps concurrently connected mm -hmm. to your system. So being able to serve those uh, a, a analytics in a scalable way. And again, here consumers, like all of us have been spoiled by our interactions with Amazon and Googles of the world. So yeah. we're expecting that level of scalability, real-time performance from every business. Correct, yeah. And last but not least, security, right? Because security, we all know, if you think about big data, it's all based on personal information, right? right? At the end of the day, mm -hmm. to get generate these kinds of predictions. So it's actually really easy, if you're not careful, to leak out this personal information which can create like huge amounts of security issues. You don't want to be the next Snapchat to go back to the, <laughs> the issue that they had. Correct, yes. Right. What about, uh, are there open source tools or is this something that they need to build? Um, I house? would say that there is open source tools around mm -hmm. uh, each of these areas. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that you need to kind of carefully uh, make sure you have the skill set to uh, construct them all together. Uh, right, so so well, you just got to understand from your side whether you actually have all this together. And if you have multiple tools, and I guess there are too many cooks in the kitchen as well, you now need to piece all these tools together. Yes, yes. So you really need very good, uh, not just data scientists, mm -hmm. but actual architects that can kind of piece right. this together. Right. Okay. Why don't we go to monitoring and management? Why is this the Achilles heel? Well, the, the truth of the matter is for uh, open source, monitoring and management is the last thing that a developer actually does for any layer of these right. stacks. And the one that I want to actually point out the most is model performance and model deployment. So model performance, when you're doing a prediction, uh, the model is doing the prediction, but you need to actually determine how good the prediction is. Right. And in kind of the world of data changing all the time, new customers mm -hmm. coming in and out and different trends changing very quickly, it's very easy to have your model performance work well on one day mm -hmm. and quickly degrade. I so see. being able to track that model performance, potentially attract that model performance across five or six different types of mm -hmm. models and uh, dynamically choose the best model becomes very, it becomes very important. And this probably gets accentuated even more in today's digital world where the way we interact with websites and apps and it keeps changing. So that model needs to be in tune with the latest patterns that are being seen in customer behavior. Correct. Yes. Yeah. That 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 can be that can cause a lot of stress because who knew the importance of Twitter just five years ago, right? Or even Pinterest. Or that Pinterest, came out of yeah. nowhere. Exactly. And that brings the next thing: model deployment. So if you think about all the data that's mm -hmm. coming into the system, changing constantly, that means you need to build new models and actually put it into production. Th this is also another Achilles heel because right now, today, from an open source world. To get good model deployment systems, you really kind of have to roll your own. Mm -hmm. There are very good deployment tools out there, but you still have to kind of roll your own different type of tools. And is it is it hard to update those models so that they continue to be performant? Yeah, it's just the reason why is because you, you really need to join the performance mm -hmm. with what you're deploying. I see. And what you're deploying, it's not quite code, mm -hmm. which there are lots of code deployment tools out there. It's not quite configuration, mm -hmm. which there are a lot of tools out there. Um, 
it's it's a little bit in between. So getting that kind of like kind of closed loop uh, between uh, looking at your performance and actual deployment becomes very difficult. So this is again an area where companies really need to pay attention. Otherwise, they will they might have really good results on the launch day, but within a few weeks or a couple months, their results would just the, all the recommendations would be out of whack. Yeah. Right. All right. So we've talked about you know data lake fairly clear, yeah. descriptive analytics, a little murky, predictive analytics, very murky. Integration and monitoring, these are things that you have to do and you know, be watchful of doing them right. Yeah. If you had to pick between build and buy, you know, what would you do? And there is no maybe, and you can't come <laughs> back later with the answer either. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, obviously I'm a little biased because we are building a predictive analytics product on big data. But what I would actually say is that majority of companies should consider buying. And you know, just step back, let's look at the stack, right? Mm -hmm. The stack is very complicated. It's non-trivial when you try to put those things together. And when you're thinking of, when you take into account the entire stack, if you want to build, there's several considerations you really need to think about, right? The maturity of open source, mm -hmm. right? Whether you have the skills and expertise and this is not just data science skills. You, you, right. need, you need computer scientists to kind of piece these systems together. Your ability to execute on this mm -hmm. as a manager, you gotta be a software, and then in a day, mm -hmm. the people who could really execute on DIY, in my opinion, are companies with really strong software development competencies. Mm -hmm. And they have to have the kind of commitment to actually contribute code back into the system. I or see. predictive analytics, right? It, it's a little different when you're just talking about descriptive or if you just want to lay down a, a data lake infrastructure. But if you want to actually use open source for uh, for predictive analytics and integrate it into the applications out mm -hmm. there in production, you got to be ready to not only cut code, uh, right. uh, not only just run the code, but also cut your own code and put it into the, and contribute back to the open source. So the bot is pretty high. Yeah, it's pretty high, it's pretty high. So if you're, if you're trying to build something very niche, mm -hmm. Um, or you're, you think that you're going to be able to commercialize this in mm -hmm. some way, then, then you can consider it. I see. So that whole TCO, the total cost of ownership, you know, we talked about it a little bit in the beginning. Yeah. But that is really illusionary here because you might think it's open source and you might be saving a bunch of money. But when you look at the skills you need, the kinds of people you need, the number of, of, that, of those skilled individuals you need, that can actually push up your TCO quite a bit. Yes. Right? What if you contrast it with buy? Yeah, and, and ultimately, you got to just separate hype and reality, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, you do have time to market considerations if you buy, especially with the newer tools, you, not not the point solutions. You actually get more. Mm -hmm. You have you can get more control and flexibility, but you got to really kind of understand what that is. And at the end of the day, it depends. You know, my my recommendation is try it out and see mm -hmm. which it does better. Right, uh, especially compared to traditional predictive analytic systems. If you don't actually take that time to do the evaluation uh, and buy into the hype, you can get into a lot of trouble. And so, 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 and then end of the day, right? Like when you want to think about this, is that what it comes down to is what's the true return on investment? How many use cases can I really solve with this predictive analytics solution that I'm buying? And I would go a step further that in making sure that the vendor has a real case studies and real deployments that have provided the ROI that you might be expecting. Right? That, is, that really helps you to separate the hype from reality. Yes, yeah. So, it, so this has been a fascinating discussion. You know, if you look at buy with, or build with open source, there is a high bar to getting it built. Could push up your cost, but you could get more control. On the buy side, you can get to market faster provided you work with a vendor who has a real real solution that has <laughs> provided real benefits to real customers. Yeah. That that seems like the key, uh, the decision point, if you will. Correct, yeah. So for everyone on the call, you know, this ends uh, the discussion. You know, we are going to continue this discussion and many other interesting topics at the I Love APIs conference. So one more shameless plug for our conference. We would love to see you there. So with that, you know, we'll open it up for questions. You give us just a second to look at the questions that have come in, and we'll we'll address a few. We have a question uh, from one of the our uh, panelists. 
Uh, which databases have you seen as emerging preferences? Cassandra, MongoDB, etc. Um, so um, just backing up a little bit about um, uh, databases, actually there's a huge amount of open source innovation around that. In the big data world, there's actually, you need to kind of separate your batch layer mm -hmm. versus your serving layer. Uh, mm -hmm. This is kind of, and what we've seen is that the batch layer, um, there's a lot of popular databases out there, namely um, uh, Hive, Impala is also getting really popular. Mm -hmm. uh, NoSQL databases obviously are, have been always very mm -hmm. popular. Uh, MongoDB in terms of NoSQL has definitely been the most popular. In fact, they have a very good uh, Hadoop connector mm -hmm. that directly uh, connects to uh, Mongo. But the, the one thing I would actually recommend is you want to make sure that whatever solution you put together, whether it's DIY or buy, is that you actually want to have a plethora mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you want to have, you want to make sure that you can solve different types of use cases. Mm -hmm. um, MongoDB and, and, and kind of NoSQL no ones, they're very good for kind of the web use case mm -hmm. where you have multiple customers trying to get information. But they're not very good for slicing and dicing information. Mm -hmm. uh, and, a lot, and actually, traditional type relational databases mm -hmm. uh, are actually better for slicing and dicing. Mm -hmm. So either you, know, you're, uh, you can use a combination of open source, uh, big data relational mm -hmm. databases, Hive or Shark, uh, and then also commercial ones as well, Postgres, Oracle, et cetera. So really, it's like the, you want to kind of like have, have, a, have a variety of different mm -hmm. databases your system. We have another question here. Do you have an on-premise or cloud solution? So I'm assuming you're asking about Apigee Insights, our predictive analytics offering on big data, and it works both on-premise and the cloud. And we found that to be very useful for clients, uh, some of which who've, who've picked on-premise and some have picked in the cloud. And what's your take on intellect, uh, safety of intellectual property uh, of data in the PA space? Um, so the question is, first the question is, well, what's, actually, this is a very good question because what's the safety of the data mm -hmm. versus the analytics? I think that's really important because if you look at the, um, when, you know, when companies buy these kind of, one of the reasons why they buy these kind of Hadoop systems is because they want to build their own intellectual property themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to rely on other people to build their intellectual property because mm -hmm. they want to build a competitive mm -hmm. advantage. So you need to kind of, you need, if you're thinking about um, uh, choosing a vendor uh, to, to help you, you really want to see, can I build my my own intellectual property mm -hmm. in a self-service way? Right. That's that's really, really important. Otherwise, you can't build your, mm -hmm. your, your mm -hmm. own competitive advantage. The other side to it is the data, right? You want to make sure that the customers don't, uh, you know, there's a lot of these SaaS services out there. Mm -hmm. They say, hey, give us your data, and we'll give you these predictive analytics really cheap. Mm -hmm. But in the background, they're actually anonymizing the data and then reselling right. data. So you need to really kind of look into the terms and condition of how the data is being used right. when you make a decision. And it's always in the fine print. Right. Cool. Well, I think that, that, that concludes uh, the questions uh, and this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. We look forward to seeing many of you at the I Love APIs conference, but you can continue to ask us questions via Twitter uh, as well. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.